Thank you, Pastor. Um, it's been, uh, I'm glad to be here. I've been away about a month. I guess it's been a month where uh, it's been a month um, and I've been had the opportunity God has blessed me to be able to uh, deliver a message at a uh, another church for uh, the past four weeks <clears throat> and it was a blessing to be there uh, but uh, it's a good it's good to be back home and have the opportunity to uh, to talk with you here the pastor has mentioned each year he would he's asked that we revisit the uh, the gifts of the spirit so i want to do that today and i'm going to do it a little differently from what i've done the last couple of years because what i want to talk about today are not the spectacular gifts there's some spectacular gifts gifts of tongues interpretation of tongues uh, healing miracles uh, prophecy those are spectacular exciting gifts uh, and god has blessed many of you with those gifts for, uh, for the church. But there are some practical gifts right. that, are, that are really used to bless us individually yeah. and to bless the church individually. So I, that's what I want to spend most of the time on today. Uh, with the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let's start with, uh, if you have your Bible, Ephesians chapter 4, verses uh, 11 through 13. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And here's the important part. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ, till we come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now that's why the Holy Spirit, God through, through the Holy Spirit, gave these gifts to the church for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for edifying the body of Christ. As Pastor says, he wants to remind us each year uh, that as members of the body of Christ, we all have something to contribute. Amen. And that something to contribute is something that was the ability to contribute that was given by God himself in a spiritual gift. And those gifts are to edify, which would mean to instruct or improve someone morally or intellectually, and in our case, each other. Now, when we first hear something, uh, we get excited about it, and we do something about it right away. Over time, though, we can lose our enthusiasm and forget some of the details, so that's why it's important for us to, remi for, to be reminded Amen. every now and then yeah. of things that are important to you and to the body of Christ. As a matter of fact, Peter said in, in one of his letters, he said this, if, this is if you want to check it out, it's 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, and here's what he says, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know that they are established in the truth. And, and the, the sense in Greek is that I will be intending to remind you always, even when we know we need, still need to be encouraged and motivated. So I'm going to today, I'm going to remind you of how important it is for you to use the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given you. Like I said, I'm not going to remind you, I'm going to mention them all, but I'm not going to talk about them all. I'm going to emphasize a few today. The ones I'm going to emphasize today are those that are described as the motivational gifts. Now they're described as a motivational gifts because they show the personality of God. These gifts show the personality of God. And as we know, God is love. So these gifts show or demonstrate 
through you, the personality of God. Now, first, some background. Each Christian, every one of you, has been given at least one spiritual gift. Amen. The gift is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit in you. It's a divine or supernatural capacity to make a significant contribution to other believers. If these gifts operate in love and in proper order, the church will accomplish what God intends for it, and that's to show the world his plan of salvation for all people, regardless of who you are. Now, the gifts are different, but they have one, some common elements. Those common elements are each manifestation, each gift is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit's presence in you. Each gift is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit's presence in you. Amen. Each gift is for the common good, not just for the person with the gift. All right. Now, the gifts, the gifts allow you to do some things in yes. the secular world, but the gifts are given for the common good of the body of Christ. And right. each gift is given as the Holy Spirit determines. Right. Now the scriptures tell us that we should pray for and that we should hope for, for the, the best gift and the gift that it's, uh, the scripture says is prophecy and you can do that. But remember the gift, each gift is determined by God. Okay. If it's God's will that you have a specific gift, you will have it. All right. All right. Uh, pray for those that you would like to have, but it's God's determination, not yours. All right. All it's right. God's determination yes. is what gift you will have. Now, there are gifts, there's a difference between a spiritual gift and a talent. Uh -oh. okay. Each one, now they're both from God. Okay. And they can both be used to bless others and the church, but they're different. Okay. Okay. Uh, a talent is the results of genetics, who your parents were or who your ancestors were, and or training. While a gift is the result only of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, talent can be possessed by anybody. Okay. A spiritual gift is only possessed by a Christian. Yeah. Only Christians have spiritual gifts. Now, there, you will see people with talents that resemble spiritual gifts. A quick example. There are, there are people who are trained to teach uh -huh. and have the ability to teach. There are others who have the spiritual gift of teaching. Okay. And while a teacher can teach and you can learn... Some with the spiritual gift of teaching can teach you things of the spirit and things of God and cause you to work and move in the way that God intends for you. Okay. Okay. Can I repeat? Uh, spiritual gifts are for the common good to build up the body of Christ. Uh, spiritual gifts are to be focused in the, on the body of Christ Talents can be used entirely for non-spiritual purposes. Okay, all right. All right? Again, because this is, this is very important, the spiritual gifts are for the common good to build the body of Christ. And again, because God loves us, these gifts can help us in our secular lives. Right. But these gifts I'm going to talk to you about today are specifically given to edify the body of Christ. Amen. If you have your Bible, I want to give you a couple of other scriptures, and in them you will learn what, what all of the spiritual gifts are. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Roman, Romans 12, 6 through 8. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, 
he who, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let's go now to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discerning of Spirit, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but again this is the important part, but to one and the, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. But again, these gifts are given by the Holy Spirit, and it's the Holy Spirit who determines who gets what gifts. Two more scriptures. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. We already read that, but I'm going to read it again. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now this will be the last one that will give you the list. That's in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it uh, as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now that's a lot of gifts in these verses. Um, now, and actually, there are more than these. Some the theologians believe there are more than these, but we talk about specific ones. I want to give you the list of those that I gave you in those scriptures A apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. The gift of prophecy, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, faith, healing, miracles, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, teaching, giving, exhortation, uh, leadership, mercy, and ministry. Now that's a long list. And uh, I go into a lot of detail in uh, the last couple of years. I'm not going to do that today. If you want to know what these gifts are specifically and how they operate, you can find them. I've written about them. You can find them on my website. And the, the, the URL for my website is in the bulletin. So if you want to know specifics about all of the gifts, go there. I don't have time to talk about those today. And again, I mentioned, told you that, that, that the, the gifts are grouped, that it grouped in three groupings. The ministry gifts, those uh, ministry gifts that they serve to reveal the plan of God, they are generally characteristic, characterized, by, characterized by an office in the church. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Those are ministry gifts. There are manifestation gifts, those that are exciting dynamic gifts. The manifestation gifts serve to reveal the power of God. They're supernatural, as are the others, and spiritual in nature. Those exciting ones, the ones we like to talk about and see all the time, or, and wish we have, and pray that we have, are prophecy, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, faith, healing, miracles, Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. Those are great and exciting gifts. 
But those are not what I want to focus on today. I want to focus on the motivational gifts. As I mentioned, the motivational gifts reveal the personality of God. These gifts are practical in nature. They are teaching, giving, exhortation or encouragement, leadership, mercy, ministering or helps. These are the gifts that God has built into us and made a part of us to be used by the benefits of others and for his glory. Now like the others, they are grace gifts. They're given by grace. We don't deserve them, but because, because God loves us, he's given them to us. Now, since they provide the motivating for, force in our lives, they're called the motivational gifts. They also shape our personality. These gifts shape our personalities. Amen. Now, we believe that these gifts are in the category of gifts that Peter was referring to when I read 1 Peter 4.10. That was, as each one of us has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. That's what these motivational gifts do minister with using them we minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God let's look at them okay let's look at the first first one's prophecy now I'm not talking about the office of a prophet I'm talking about the gift of prophecy now prophecy is the speaking of the word of God that he gives for edification. It's not fortune telling. Okay? It's forth telling. It's speaking the word of God. For example, a lot of times you will hear in a service someone praying in tongues. Someone praying in tongues, not speaking in tongues, praying in tongues, and someone else or that person will then say, God heard, and this is what God says. That's speaking forth, that's prophecy. That's a prophetic gift. That's a gift of prophecy. That's not the interpretation of tongues. That's a, that's a prophetic utterance. Because what you're saying is the, the word of God says, or God wants you to know, and it is backed up by scripture. Uh, so Prophecy is the divine enablement to proclaim God's truth with power and clarity in a timely fashion for correction, for repentance, or edification. Now, there is some evidence that the gift of prophecy may be some for telling of the future. However, be very careful be very careful in when you hear that to make sure that is a prophecy from God and not the tactics used by fortune tellers like Miss Cleo and others. Now because that is fortune telling is an abomination from God and it's used to dupe people and give false hope or fear. So there are, there are there is a gift of prophecy in the church, but be careful if someone says to you, God told me this about you, and this is going to happen to you. And so be very careful. But the gift of prophecy is used primarily for correction, repentance, or edification. Um, Those with this gift are sensitive to both the prompting of the Holy Spirit and the needs of the church body. People with the gift of prophecy should be humble, uh, but they often seem blunt because what their gift is is for correction and edification. They sometimes seem blunt and opinionated, and they can cause you to be uncomfortable. The results of this gift cause strengthening, correction, 
and encouragement and ultimately comfort if it helps the person using this if it helps if the person using this gift has built up a credible reputation so if someone has a gift of prophecy and they and they utter even utterance in uh, in church and it may seem harsh it may have correction but if it's done humbly and this person has built a credibility with you you will receive that there's a caution to anyone with that gift if you have it cautions are these people can lack compassion and may not keep love unity and the building up of others as their goal if that happens it leads to discouragement and disharmony God in his wisdom though will balance that in his body because he also has in the body of Christ those with the gift of mercy we'll talk about those in a few minutes uh, we have some we have some examples in scripture of uh, those with the gift of prophecy I just want to give you a couple of them uh, the, in Acts chapter 11 uh, verse 27 and 28 there's a guy by the name of Agabus who was a prophet Acts chapter 11 verses 27 and 28 and in these days came from Jerusalem uh, these days prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch one of them was one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar so in this instance Agabus was giving was was foretelling but it was for the protection of those in uh, in in Israel to warn them. There's another example, also in Acts chapter 21, verses 10 and 11. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus again came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bowed his hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit. So that so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So Agabus was telling Paul, or warning Paul, what was going to happen when he went to Jerusalem. Now, in the body of Christ, those with the gift of prophecy should be used. Those are people that would lead others in prayer. Uh, those with the gift of prophecy preach or deliver sermons. They can teach. Uh, they can uh, 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 lead in outreach because, again, it, it's what we're talking, want to do here is edify, speaking forth the word of God to edify. So, a person with that gift can do a lot of things. Can lead in prayer, they can preach, they can teach, they can uh, be just they can, they can be the leader of devotion. Because it's someone speaking forth the word of God. That's prophecy. The gift of teaching, which is the divine enablement to understand, clearly explain, and apply the word of God to the lives of believers. To instruct others in the Bible in a logical, systematic way, so as to communicate pertinent information for true understanding and growth. Typically, the teacher explains what the prophet proclaims. The teacher is a good communicator. So as you're thinking about yourself, think about this. The teacher is a good communicator, uh, has a thirst for knowledge, and loves to learn. They're generally self-disciplined and usually prefer to teach groups rather than one-on-one. -on -one. That's another gift. A pastor wants to teach one-on-one, -on -one, or a shepherd wants to teach one-on-one. -on -one. A teacher prefers lead teaching uh, a group. Gifted teachers do not just teach Bible knowledge and doctrine, but when they explain God's truth, people can, can be and are set free of sin, natural limitations, depression, fear, and anxiety. A naturally gifted teacher may be able to explain to people why they sin and what the Bible has to say about the sin, but a teacher who is, who is spiritually gifted releases the Holy Spirit's power through the gift to set that other person free. 
Now, there's a caution to those with that gift. Uh, I have it, and it, I, it, I really have to watch this. The teacher may struggle to keep things simple because they're too detailed. Don't, not wanting to miss anything. The teacher can be too profound, theological, and sometimes even esoteric. Uh, and sometimes uh, the, it, it can result in a sense of superiority. And that, in those times, the teacher becomes unteachable. Teachers can also become frustrated when others don't get it and can't keep up the pace for knowledge and insight. Teachers are often good communicators, but lousy listeners. <laughs> Here's an example, a scriptural example, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Paul is writing to his son Timothy, son in the uh, gospel of Timothy, and he says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me, among other witnesses, Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, this teacher's a gift of teaching can be used in a Bible study group. It can be used to disciple others, new converts or new members. The gift can be used in training. You can teach an adult Bible study class or adult Sunday school class or children's Sunday school class can lead a small group or in the planning stages you can a teacher uh, someone with that gift can lead or chair an education committee of the church or, or a Christian education group of the church so we've talked we looked at prophecy and we looked at teaching when we look at giving now another motivational gift giving is a divine enablement and ability to contribute money and material resources to the work of the Lord with cheerfulness and liberality. Givers take special delight in discovering needs that others overlook and then meeting those needs. These people give generously, freely, and joyfully. They don't just give money but they're free with all their possessions. And when I'm, when I'm talking about this gift, I'm not talking about time. Okay? You give time, that's another gift. But I'm talking about giving of material possessions. Uh, but they don't just give money, but are free with all their possessions. They're always not the rich among us, but are often, they're often given the talent for making money and increasing wealth. If you have a gift of giving, you may not be wealthy, but you have an ability to, uh, to raise money, for example, or an ability to increase the wealth of others, even though you have no interest in it yourself. They give above and beyond the normal tithe and offering. They see themselves as caretakers and stewards of their resources so they can give. They are careful with their resources so they can give. Now, givers are usually prefer anonymity. People with the spiritual gift of giving usually do not want you to know that they have given. Now, here's a caution, though, with that gift. They can think that giving should give them respect and a place of leadership in the church. They can make the error of replacing serving with giving. Another caution is that those with these gifts can see themselves as the ultimate authority deciding through their giving which ministries are worthy to fund and which should die of financial neglect. People with this gift, that's a caution. Because they have the resources and freely give it, there's a caution to, to those people that they decide, because of what I'm giving, which ministries should uh, continue and which ministries should die. Rather than leave those decisions to the Holy Spirit through those that God has given other gifts to be leaders and pastors and ministers. 
Uh, a scriptural example of uh, belie- givers in the, in the early church, uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 34 and 35. Acts 4, 34 and 35. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each one, to each as everyone had need. Now, those with that, those with that gift are important because they can provide financial assistance, they can support missionaries, support ministries. They are excellent in fundraising, and they're excellent stewards. Uh, as we grow, we will have need for a, a, a more direction in our financial management. Those with that gift would be important to be a part of that. So we've talked about prophecy, teaching, and giving. Now I want to move to exhortation or encouragement. Exhortation or encouragement is the divine enablement to reassure, strengthen, and affirm those around you. Uh, The primary means of exhortation is to remind the hearer of the powerful and amazing work of Christ, particularly in regard to the saving work of Jesus. The goal of of the exhorter or the the goal of the encourager is to see that everyone in the church uh, to see everyone in the church continually uh, built up in the knowledge of Christ and glorifying God. The characteristics are uh, um, well let me read a little bit. Uh, The term, uh, the the Greek term that's used for exhorter is parakleto, which is the word that, which is the word that is translated as Holy Ghost, or the one that comes alongside. So the encourager, or the exhorter, is one who comes alongside to encourage and give strength and support. These are people that bring comfort to those who are going through difficult times and they tend to be very positive and complimentary. They're expressive about God's will being attained and their goal is to motivate, comfort, and challenge. Now, there's a caution there, though, with the exhorter. Uh, the, 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 the encourager sometimes need to guard against being a yes man or woman. And they may not be good at confrontation when it's needed. Their optimism may not take into account when some issues need the prophet's challenge. For example, if if, if the the encourager sees someone who appears to be down spiritually, but they need the prophet to point out their reason for discouragement, the exhorter may, on the other hand, continue to encourage them to stay, and they stay in that state. They don't do anything about where, where they are. So while encouragement and exhortation is important, that person needs to be aware that sometimes the issues need to play out. The next gift, because I am going to run out of time, the next gift is uh, leadership. Well, let me tell you where where encouragement could be in the church, where that work would be best. Would be uh, in the visitation or sick ministry, uh, counseling, greeters, okay, uh, prayer ministry, uh, evangelism, evangelism ministry, and even the music ministry. Someone with the gift of exhortation, when they sing or play, it encourages, through the music, encourages others. So, you may have that spiritual gift and you be a vocalist or psalmist or a musician. Okay, the next next gift is the gift of leadership or administration, which is the divine enablement to understand what makes an organization tick. 
and the, the, the special ability to plan, execute, and achieve procedures that increase the church's organizational effectiveness. It's the divine enablement to attract, to lead, to motivate people to accomplish the work of the ministry. Now this gift is distinguished from regular administration or leadership in that its focus is to edify the church. Those same abilities, again, are, can benefit you in your secular work, but the spiritual gift, the focus is to edify the church. The characteristics of this person are that they love to organize, strategize, and systematize things to make them run more smoothly, efficiently, and effectively. They're experts at knowing how something works or functions. They're constant improvers of those systems and can tell others or delegate how to get something done uh, and to get from point A to point B. They're great troubleshooters and they can, can anticipate problems. These people are great overseers and goal setters in the church. Okay? They are motivators of vision and direction. The good ones, though, are team players and delegators who take the initiative when others do not make decisions. They're natural leaders who can point out the direction and course that others will follow. They dream big. Credibility and respect are needed if a person in this, with these gifts can function. Now, the caution is they can become focused on the task, charts, and graphs and lose sight of the people. They can be too black and white in their approach to issues and problems. They tend to lack flexibility and depend on systems and strategies more than the Holy Spirit to get things done. They're detailed people who need a visionary leader to inspire them. Um, administrators are good detailed people but cannot, are not good visionaries. In leadership, this gift uh, needs to be supportive of the apostles, the prophets, the teachers, and the pastors. The, gift, the leader can have the potential of becoming overconfident and even demeaning some of the other gifts. They have the potential of losing sight of the individual and only seeing the crowd. Leaders can often tell others where the church is going and where ministry is headed, but they are poor at charting the course and showing others how to get there. They're often poor at details. Good leaders must surround themselves with people who have the gift, the other gifts of administration with regard to detail. These people are good uh, to lead planning teams. They're good ministry coordinators. They're good organizers of special events. They're good uh, people to be chairpersons of committees or board. Uh, they're, good, they're good small group leaders. Uh, and they can be good teachers, uh, but, but, but most uh, assuredly leading a, uh, a, a Christian ministry of education, not necessarily being a teacher. Then there's a gift of mercy. The gift of mercy is the divine enablement to minister cheerfully and appropriately to people who are suffering. Mercy is what we, what we express when we are led by God to be compassionate in our attitudes, words, and actions. It's more, it's more than just feeling sympathy towards someone. It's actually love in action. Mercy desires to answer the immediate needs of others and to alleviate suffering, loneliness, and grief. Mercy addresses physical emotional, financial, or spiritual crisis with generous self-sacrificial service. Mercy is the champion of the poor, the lowly, the exploited, and the forgotten. Characteristics are people uh, 
that assume the needs of others. They, they often want to remove the pain of others. As I said before, they aren't merely sympathetic, but they take action to alleviate the suffering. They often find themselves focused around social issues and developing ministries along those lines. For example, homeless ministry, sick and shut in ministry, prison ministry, single parents ministry, the poor, those kinds of ministries. They reflect the heart and compassion of God. Now here's a caution though. They have the potential of being rescuers. Okay? Some pain and suffering is allowed and used by God as a tool to teach and correct behavior. The person with the gift of mercy needs to be aware of when God does not want the pain immediately removed and when rescuing someone actually may perpetuate the problems in the person's life. Now, uh, a, an example of a person with the gifts of, of mercy would obviously be the, the Good Samaritan. You know, the, the, uh, the parable of the Samaritan came by and took the, uh, the man had been robbed and injured, uh, took him to the innkeeper and paid for his upkeep. That, that's someone who wanted to alleviate that person's suffering. That's an example of someone with the gift of mercy. Now, those people would be good in uh, visitation ministries, as I mentioned, hospital and shut-in ministries. They would be good in nursery. If there was a nursery, that person would be a homeless ministry, a food pantry. When we get to that point where we have those kinds of, those are people that would have the ability to function in those ministries. And finally, there's, there's, there's a, a group of uh, spiritual gifts or ministry helps. We sometimes call it service. We sometimes call it helps. Although that's a divine enablement to attach spiritual value to the accomplishment of physical tasks within the body of Christ. This is a special anointing by which one stands alongside and serves in a very personal way those leading the church. Uh, the helper knows personally how to serve the leadership's needs, and they can sometimes speak with authority on their behalf. Uh, for example, there's, there's a, a group in, in some churches that are called armor bearers. There, there are people who come, along, come alongside to help and serve the pastor. Those people can sometimes speak with the authority of the pastor. Now, the Holy Spirit in uh, endow some believers with this gift to fill the many gaps of ministry and to meet the needs of the church.